Studio 33 AD, Catholic Media. How is the Cathedral Church of St. John the Evangelist this morning? Good, we walk in blessing, don't we? What a grace to be alive today. Another day to work out our salvation. God has blessed us. And today God does something marvelous in our lives. He washes us with his word. None of you come speaking to church today, right? There's been a bathing of your bodies. But a more wonderful bathing takes place through God's holy word. Ephesians 5.26 reminds us that we have to be washed by the word of God in our lives. And what God gives us is not just in the old word, it's a power, it's a word of power, of truth, of revelation, a word that can transform our lives. John 17, 17 reminds us that the word of God can truly sanctify our lives. And think about the goodness of our God. He does not give us his word because he wants to destroy us. Rather, he has an intention of opening doors, of making us whole, of leading us to a new place. He gives us his word, as Psalm 107, verse 20 reminds us, because he wants to heal every one of our lives. Yet do we know who we are? It's very easy to get confused in the world. I was thinking about the last Mass, and I was observing a mother with her child, and the little boy needed the bathroom. And so he was rushing toward the bathroom, and his mama got his hand and said, I can't go in there. And so she grabbed his hand and started walking into the uh, girl's bathroom, and the little boy said, but mama, I'm not a girl. <laughs> Oftentimes we gather into church and we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, it's the way that we most lie on Sunday. Because oftentimes we come to church like saints and leave like devils. <laughs> because we forget who we are. Every time that we begin this liturgy, a testimony is given to us. A proclamation is given to the people of God as the Mass begins in the procession. And we often think that we are in procession uh, the priests are in procession along with the ministers of the altar simply because we need to arrive to the altar. That's not the reason for the procession. It's a teaching to each one of us. Wake up, people of God. You are no longer citizens of this earth. You are citizens of heaven. We are going toward the new Jerusalem. We espouse new values. We are a new people because of the grace of our baptism. And we have to be about building the kingdom of God. Philippians 3.20 We are no longer citizens of this earth. Today, we have to ascertain for ourselves, is Jesus radically right or radically wrong? Is he like C.S. Lewis used to argue in 1942? Is Jesus either a lunatic, a liar, or is he Lord? Because all of that is going to have implications. If he's a lunatic, if he's a liar, or if he's Lord. Because we're going to pattern our lives. Yes, we come to church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But what happens Monday morning when you wake up to that spouse of yours? You no know, makeup on, their hair all over the place. What do you say, what do you do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, or something else. What happens that Monday morning? You're stressed. You got up late. You got to get to work. And yet, the children haven't woken up yet. You have to wake them up, prepare their school clothes, find their school supplies, prepare their breakfast, make sure they're bathed and dressed. And you've got to get them in the car and get to work on time. And somehow, by God's grace, you manage it. And when you put them in the car and leave your driveway, then somehow, all of a sudden comes in front of you, driving like a turtle, distracted on the cell phone, distracted with their individual problems in their own personal lives. What do you say? What do you do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? Or something else? 
<laughs> what happens when you come home on a Monday evening? You just came home from a job you don't even like, but you go to work every day going to that job because you know you have a responsibility for your children and your family and you care for them and so you don't complain and you bear what it takes to do that work every single day and you come home and you try to give direction to your children and they don't pay attention to you. They argue with you. They say to you, Mama, Daddy, what do you know about the modern age? You belong to the dinosaur age. <laughs> what do you say? What do you do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When we listen to the Gospel, we may confu be confused and think that Jesus is contradicting com contemplation versus action. And that's not the point of the Gospel. He's teaching us how to be holy in our lives and what's necessary. There has to be primary, something primary out of it, which every, everything else flows. And that's that relationship with God, that moment of intimacy. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. That place where we surrender before God, where we say with our whole hearts and our whole lives, into me see, Lord, intimacy, intimacy. See those places that still are not whole. See those places that are broken. See those places that are very much alive in you, Lord. See all those places so that I may come truly your image and likeness in the midst of the world, Genesis 1:27, as we are created in God's holy image. Otherwise, what are we going to do? We're going to complain and be miserable like Martha. Busy, busy, busy. Thinking she's accomplishing much, but complaining through the whole process. You've seen people in church like that? Because we don't have the foundation. That foundation is necessary. And out of that life flows. The power to be, live in the image and the likeness of God. The power to be able to stretch out our hands like Jesus did. The power to bend down. The same Pope Gregory the Great used to say that we have to be willing to bend down to help another stand up. It's what Jesus did perfectly in his life. He became sin and death. He humbled himself. And what grace we have right now. And so we have to think about how to become holy. Contemplation necessary, primary, but it's not the only thing. It will move us into building up God's kingdom, into the action that is also part of being whole in Christ. My name is Father Carlos Chavez. I am a priest of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. I've been a priest 38 years now. Uh, seven years ago, I began to think radically about what Jesus said about his own life. Luke 4, 18, I've come to bring good news to the poor. Live, uh, uh, sight to the blind, uh, liberty to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed. Jesus himself understood God's holy word because he was echoing Isaiah 61, 1, where the same thing is proclaimed. Jesus understood that he was called to bear good news to those in need. And the one that taught me much about how we have to become what we receive is my own grandmother. My mother died when I was very young, and I remember my mother, grandmother spending three hours of time in prayer every single day. I used to wonder, what does she have so much to talk to God about? <laughs> it would either be at her home or at where we would walk to the local church. We didn't have the pleasure of receiving the Eucharist very often. If we were lucky enough to, and blessed enough to receive the Eucharist once a year, that was a whole lot because we didn't have priests that would come to the village where, uh, where I grew up at that particular time in history. There was a very severe shortage of priests in my diocese, so priests didn't come very often. But nonetheless, my grandmother taught me that you have to become what you receive. 
Become what it is that you proclaim as you receive the body and the blood of Christ, you are called to become his body and blood in the midst of the world. And I remember that often my grandmother didn't have the pleasure of having an electrical stove. She lived on the farm and people would come to her door day and night. Strangers that sometimes were very scary looking, spoke different languages, didn't often know what they were saying. But my grandmother, they were traveling the trains crossing through. We lived through the, uh, by the train tracks and uh, they were crossing through looking for work all over the country. And uh, my grandmother never hesitated, was never afraid. She understood the sign language, I'm hungry, when they, they needed something to eat. So my grandmother would wake us up if we had to be woken up and go chop the wood and we'd get the wood ready and she'd light her fire and prepare something uh, to feed that individual whatever time of day it was. That really blessed me in my, my life because I understood that we can't just say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We can't be forgetful about who we are and sometimes we forget it makes me recall an elderly gentleman who went to celebrate the anniversary of his marriage. And they were walking, the couple was walking with the waiter to the table. And this day the waiter was hearing words that were very distinct from this couple. Unique, he would say to his wife, my rose, my lovely one, my most beautiful one. When they got to the table, the lady excused herself, she needed the bathroom, and the waiter said to the gentleman, Sir, how long have you been married? And he said, Seventy years. Seventy years! He said, Wow, that's amazing, and you still speak to your wife in such a lovely and beautiful way? Please, sir, tell me your secret. One day I want to be a good husband. What is your secret? And he said, Sonny, it's that I forgot her name. <laughs> Martha had obviously forgotten something about her life, and we can't do the same. We have to understand that we have to choose that better portion so that we can do the other, so that we can serve with joy and with peace and with gladness, stretching out our lives like Christ stretched out his life, his life. Cross Catholic Outreach, you have the brochures, amazing ministry a breaking bread ministry, miraculous in the way that I see it, what we have been doing in the midst of the world uh, seems small in comparison to what we have to do in terms of the poverty that we face in the world. I see the ministry of Cross Catholic Outreach as a grain of sand in a bucket full of sand because so much has to be done, but yet I see how much we've done. In the 21 years that we've been alive in this and been able to serve uh, the Catholic Church in these last 21 years, we've been able to distribute $3.3 billion to people all over the world, whether it's building wells, hospitals, schools, whether it's orphanages, whether it's feeding people, dressing people, which is teaching people how uh, skills, because our endeavor is never simply to give out a fish, uh, we want to teach people how to fish or to be a handout, we want to be a handout. We teach people electrical skills, reading skills, uh, how to uh, produce their native art, how to farm in a better way sometimes, how to take care of animals so that they can have them to sell, so that, uh, so that they can have a living. It depends on the, where we're at in the midst of the world, what we do. I don't know if you know in the world today, 29,000 people die a day because of waterborne diseases. 60% of the world is water vulnerable. Think about the reality of children having to leave their homes walking four to five miles, sometimes more, and the danger that they're placed in because 20,000 children leave in places like Haiti or Guatemala to go find water. And many of those children become vulnerable because about 15% uh, will be taken advantage of, ca become captives of someone, and they will be sold into the slave 
traffic, uh, the human trafficking of the world, which is horrible today. The human trafficking of the world is endemic. One out of every 200 individuals find themselves as a slave of another. Their bodies are brutalized. It's an industry of the devil that produces $152 billion for the perpetrators of such evil. People take advantage of other human beings so easily, as though they had no value in and of themselves, as though they are a dirty dish track. We're confronting those realities. I think about people that do not even have a piece of bread to eat. 25,000 die a day because they don't have a piece of bread to eat. Not one single bread. I remember uh, clearly being in Sopango in Guatemala and watching children in this hospital, orphanage school that we have, where we have hundreds and hundreds of children. Why? Simply because parents become so desperate they do not have a piece of bread, they go and find the coffee berry. And what they don't know, it's a neurological toxin. And in that place, you see children, their bodies not being able to be controlled, spasming all over the place, or blind or cannot hear, simply because their parents were in the midst of a great desperation, wanting to feed them something, something that would bring comfort to them, not knowing that they were actually destroying their bodies. I think about the abortion rate today, 126,000. That amounts to 46 million a year. And we think laws can change circumstances. Laws will never change anything, unless the heart changes. Because what we don't know right now is there's 635 million orphans throughout the world that need care. Some of those are lucky enough to have a grandparent, someone taking care of them, an uncle, an aunt, some stranger, but there are 18.5 million that absolutely have no one, and the world has to change because we have to stretch out ourselves in that hospitality and receiving, creating a space for the stranger, the broken one, the one that's in need. We have to think about that reality constantly in our lives. So cross-Catholic outreach finds itself involved in all of these realities. And so we have to simply ask ourselves, at what table do we eat at? At the table of the Lord or at the table of demons? And I ask that consciously because I remember being in one parish in the Southwest where I talked about the reality of the poor and what they suffer. I remember that there was a gentleman sitting in front of me, hearing the gospel, hearing the homily, participating in the liturgy, partaking of the body and the blood of Christ. When I was receiving these brochures at the end of Mass, he yelled at me at the, at the, at the loud voice, and he said, Father, let them die. I remember being in another parish in the Midwest. It was an all Caucasian parish. I usually get sent to parishes where there's the need for both languages, but in this particular parish, uh, uh, it was the all English speaking, and I uh, remember also a woman coming into Mass with her husband and her children. And the children were very distinct because you could see that they had handicaps of all different kinds, uh, uh, were, had disabilities of all different sorts, and these children were of African American descent. But she introduced them to me as her children. And uh, uh, she had obviously adopted them. She received communion. When I went to the back of the church to receive the brochures, she gave me a check for $50,000. She said, make a difference for God's little ones in the midst of the world. So what table do we partake in? We have to think about that.
people are suffering in the world. I think about Valentina in our home in Casa Alianza, Managua, Nicaragua. She was abandoned in the dumps in Managua at the age of three. If you know anything about the children that are abandoned all over the world, they have to fight for their existence. Valentina used to have to carry this a pole with a, a hook attached to it because she had to fight for her existence. Every time the down trucks came in, she had to try to grab something to sell. 25 cents she needed to make in order to eat good food. If not, she was only going to eat the trash and the spoiled food. At the age of seven, she was violated by a group of boys. Horribly, I won't go into the details because of the children here but she was sold into human trafficking by those boys. She became addicted to a drug in order to survive her horrible existence. We didn't discover her until she was 13. She lived 10 years of darkness, 10 years of no hope. Whenever you hear Valentina speak, she shakes and puts her hands together. If there are bishops, priests, or lay people hearing her, she will say, thank God for the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank God for the hope of tomorrow. As she continues, when she finishes speaking about her existence, she will always hold up her finger as though she's going to accuse the audience for what she has suffered in her life. But this is what she always tells the priests, the nuns, the lay people. Don't tell your, uh, don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big your God is. Obviously, this girl knows Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is calling us today in his gospel. Create that space that place for intimacy so that we can be healed and made whole. If there's anything that you can do about this ministry of Cross Catholic Outreach, we promise you, brothers and sisters, we will take very good care of your resources. 94.95% will go directly to the poor. Very little money is ever utilized for the administration of our ministry, thinking of these brochures, there's 63 priests and one bishop who do what I do, go out every weekend seeking these resources because of what we need to do throughout the world. Very little money is used for our travels. Most of that money, 94.95%, will go directly to the poor. You can put your information in these brochures if you want. If you, uh, you can uh, put your cash, credit card, check, we promise you. If we don't sell your information to anyone else, as I said, if you, there's something you can do about this ministry today, you can deposit these brochures as you leave the church. I will receive them. If not, you can send them in by snail mail. There's already a stamp. You can go online. The address is here. You can go to crosscatholic.org forward slash dot week and um, you can send them in uh, through PayPal. You can go through the to the scan code also, if you're more technologically savvy, and it will direct you to the donation page, or you can go to your phone and type the word lessons, 474747, hit send. It will take you to the donation page. The Miraculous is done, I think with $35. If you think about that reality, when you go to the grocery store, not much is bought today. We can't come out with much when you go buy something uh, food for $35. You will not bring much out with, in your bags, but with $35 we can feed 233 people in the third and fourth world. To me, that's a miracle. This is the places that we're at in the world. All the covered, colored places will indicate where we're at in the midst of the world, serving God's poor, for this, uh, transforming the lives of the poor in their communities for the sake of the glory of God. St. Augustine was once asked, what does love look like? He said it has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and the needy. It has the eyes to see misery and want. It has the ears to hear the sighs and the sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. 
St. Catherine of Siena said, if you know who you're supposed to be, you will go and set the world on fire with the love and the mercy of God. Mother Teresa, if you pray, you will believe. If you believe, you will love. And if you love, you will serve. So be it. How is it possible? Martha, how is it possible to choose the better portion? Christ in us, the hope of glory. We were told that in the sacred word today. Colossians 1.27, Romans 8.11 says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the very same spirit is within us. In other words, brothers and sisters, no excuses. Know who you are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and profess our faith. Studio 33 AD, Catholic Media.